Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we can get started if you're ready, Emma. Yeah, sure. Ah, okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, there are just a few things to note. Please let me know if you have any technical issues that I can try to resolve. You can send those to me in the chat. You can also send questions or comments in the chat and we'll address them at the end. Uh, closed captioning will be enabled for this program. So if you, if you find it distracting, you can just select the more button and uh, disable live transcript. Uh, it may appear differently on what device you're using as it's not uniform across Zoom, unfortunately. Uh, just feel free to send me a message if you're having difficulty. This program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. And I'd like to now introduce Emma Byrne. Emma is a scientist and writer appearing in Wired, The Guardian, as well as frequently appearing on Sky News and BBC. She is the author of Swearing is Good for You, The Amazing Science of Bad Language, and her forthcoming book, How to Build a Human. Today, Emma is here to talk about talk to us about the science of swearing. And as tempting as it was to include a swear in my introduction, I will possibly just leave that to my speaker, the speaker. So please welcome Emma. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, yes, I'll try and keep it fairly clean, not least because I'm not sure how automatic closed captioning deals with swear words, particularly in a British accent. Um, but yeah, my name's Emma Byrne. My background is actually in artificial intelligence and computational neuroscience. So building computer models of structures that we know exist in the brain and seeing how they learn. Um, I was particularly interested in the visual system and in essentially recreating some very fine grain models of primate visual systems to try to understand how we learn from experience and what it is that both evolution and life course development does for our visual systems. So that might leave one major question open at the moment, which is how on earth does somebody who is doing that end up researching swearing? Um, well, I was lucky enough in about 2007 to be invited to join a lab that was based out of the Science Museum in London. And one of the brilliant things that this museum does, uh, and I'm sure there are several that do this in the States as well, which is the, it's the first Thursday of every month. They throw all the school groups out, get rid of all the kids at about 6.30 p.m., close the doors and then set up a load of bars and a load of really nice places where you can have there's like a silent disco or places where you can do some fun experiments. And one of the conditions of our um, of our residency here at this museum was that we had to perform some form of science uh, and it was very much performing it was very much demonstrations rather than um, sort of hard and fast research uh, in in this in this uh, science museum but one of the things that they'd asked me to do was to come up with experiments that we could do with members of the public and I was looking at sort of various papers on how, at that time I was very interested on how pain or aversive stimulus as it's sort of less, in, uh, less emotively called sometimes in the, in the literature, how aversive stimulus shares, uh, shapes the way that we learn. And I came across a brilliant paper from a researcher called Dr. Richard Stevens, who is at the University of Keele. And he had hit his thumb while building a shed one day and let out this stream of swearing as quite often people do. But he'd just been reading in the literature around swearing that swearing is actually a catastrophic response, that if you swear, all it does is focus your attention on whatever it is that's just gone wrong. It makes you feel far worse. Um, it's definitely a counterproductive thing to do. And this got him thinking, if it's so counterproductive, if it is so maladaptive, why on earth do we swear? And of course, being a psychology researcher he ha and a psychology lecturer, he has a steady stream of psychology undergraduates who, again, I think this is pretty common in the States as well, your psychology undergraduates are usually a pretty good bunch of people that you can use for experiments. 
So he had a psychology undergraduate stick their hand in buckets of ice cold water and use either a neutral word or a swear word to see how long they could keep their hands in this very cold, very painful water. And he found that fairly consistently, people can keep their hands in ice water about half as long, again, if they're swearing than if they're using a neutral word. So this intrigued me, not least because I'm a bit of a swearer myself, um, but also because I needed an experiment that I could do for cheap with members of the public. And so lo and behold, the next time we had one of these lates, I set up my buckets of ice and my stopwatches and I had people come in and I used the various techniques that he'd used to make sure that this was a fair test. There's some fun stuff about randomizing that I can go into later if people want to know more details, ask him the questions. Um, and I had people do this experiment. But as I say, it was more of a demonstration than an experiment. The main reason being, if you're ever setting up a psychology experiment where there is a bar, you will find that if you plot the time of the evening uh, along the bottom axis, the longer you get through the evening, which is a very good proxy variable for how much people have had to drink, the more variable the results get. So I wasn't able to reproduce these results at all, but I was intrigued and I started reading lots about swearing and I would end up boring my colleagues and my friends and my family until in the end someone said, you just write it down, just write it down. And around the same time, I was working for the Association of British Science Writers, um, sort of on the side, and I attended a, um, a pitching session where, again, somebody said, you know, this is very interesting. People are interested in swearing. You just write something on swearing. And I ended up with a stack of research about, I can't even fit it in the window. Um, what is it in American units? That's two, three foot tall on my desk. Um, and decided to go off and do this research and see if I could pull it together into some kind of coherent narrative. Now, the problem is my background, as I mentioned, it's in cognitive neuroscience. And one of the things that those of you who are researchers will be used to is if you're going to research any phenomenon, you need a very clear definition of what that phenomenon is. Unfortunately, when you read papers on swearing, there are vast numbers of them. For all that many of them say that swearing is an understudied subject, there are actually a lot of papers on swearing. But most of them differ slightly in what they define swearing as. Now, my original training was in logic, and I'm used to the idea of an intentional and an extensional definition of a phenomenon. So you have an extensional definition whereas you just list all of the things so if you want a, an extensional definition of fish you would start with like um albacore tuna um i should have thought of some fish earlier shouldn't i um guppies um haddock place cod you know you go through and you list every fish that's known to the human race if you had an intentional definition you might say things like has scales lives in water breathes through gills the problem with swearing is there is neither an extensional nor an intentional definition. That's because we don't agree as a species, we don't even agree within individual societies what constitutes a true swear word. And that's because swearing is incredibly culturally situated. And I'll explain a bit about how it shapes or how our adolescence generally shapes what we understand as swearing. Uh, a little later in the talk. And the reason that I couldn't use an intentional definition is that each author chose something slightly different. So I had to come up with a definition that would work for the book, a, a way of setting out my stall of what I considered to be swearing. Uh, and so I came up with several tests, one of which was that it should refer to something that's taboo in that speaker's society or the society that they're in while they're uttering or writing this word. It's something that you would think carefully about using in front of, say, a new boss or your partner's parents, for example, if you hadn't met them before. It's language that is emotive that tends to make the heart rate rise or the uh, galvanic skin response, the sort of sweatiness of the palms increase. Um, and it's the kind of language that we use in very emotive situations, either to abuse or amuse, to distract or to bring attention to something. Uh, and so these are the kinds of hallmarks of swearing. 
and using that as my starting point, I had a handle on what it was that I wanted to talk about. And so I did a bunch of research. I didn't actually set out to write swearing is good for you. I just wanted to know the neuroscience behind swearing, what it is that it does to our brains, what it is that it does in our bodies. And it does do some very interesting things in our bodies. I mentioned before that adolescence really shapes what you think of as a swear word. There is some very nice research that was done by a Turkish researcher on Turkish American students. And she took students who had learned Turkish, uh, sorry, who had learned British English as a second language after their adolescence. And so had learned swear words after adolescence. And she took those who had been bilingual from very early on and who had attended high school in the United States or had had other exposures to informal English, shall we say, throughout their adolescence. And she had them recite various phrases. Some were neutral, some had swear words in, and some were what she called childhood reprimands, things like tidy your room, finish your dinner, don't speak like that to your mother. And she found that for all of these Turkish students, bear in mind these are Turkish students in their sort of late teens, early 20s, they experienced very strong emotive reactions to the childhood reprimands in Turkish and to the swear words in Turkish. But only those who'd learnt uh, American English before adolescence responded in any way emotionally to the uh, the American English swear words. And I just dis distinguish American English swear words from British swear words because we do have some that I think are becoming more common in the United States. Um, but yes, our, our swearing lexicon, like much of our lexicon, doesn't entirely overlap. So it's done very specifically on American English swearing. And she found that, yeah, adolescence, there is a cutoff point at which we lose a lot of the plasticity, not all of the plasticity, but a lot of the plasticity of our brains, uh, particularly for things like uh, social understanding, you know, what is or is not offensive, what is or is not funny. And once you have passed through adolescence, you may well pick up other swear words, but they never have that same emotional impact. And the way that we can measure that emotional impact is through a number of different tests. There is the ice bucket test. Uh, now we know because it's been replicated so often that um, swearing seems to provide something that is sometimes known as um, stress-based analgesia. Uh, so it will kill pain because it causes this or enhances a stress response, um, because we know that swearing makes heart rates rise, because we know that swearing makes people start late, uh, because we know that swearing makes uh, hands get more, more sweaty, increases the galvanic skin response. We don't have to ask people whether or not they find a word offensive. We can kind of eavesdrop on their emotional states and that gives us a very quick and accurate picture of whether or not people are responding to swear words. Why would we want to do that rather than just asking them? Well, that's also because swearing is such a socially constructed phenomenon. Um, I'm speaking here as a woman who swears a lot. There are quite a few studies that I touch on in the book that looked at women and swearing as a separate phenomenon. There are papers called Why Do Women Swear? Whereas for context, there's no paper called Why Do Men Swear? That's sort of taken as a given. And if you look back through history, it's actually only during about the 1600s that women start to be, or at least in British English anyway, women are moved out of the sphere of swearing. And there is one book in particular that is incredibly influential uh, around this time called the, um, it's by Richard Alastry and it's called The Lady's Calling. Um, and in that, Richard Alastry, who was the, um, uh, the, the person who basically ran all of the religious offices for the king at the time, uh, he said that there was, let me get the quote exactly right, there is no sound more odious to the ears of God than an oath in the mouth of a woman. Um, so, you know, not the sound of somebody who is ill, not the sound of somebody who is injured, not the sound of a hungry child. No, no, a woman saying a rude word is the worst sound that could offend the ear of God. And this caught on very quickly. 
uh, the master of the revels, uh, the person in charge of essentially the state sponsor, uh, the state censor at the time, starts censoring language in plays, particularly if it purports to come from a female character. Women in literature, the burgeoning field of literature, are basically all of their swear words are taken away. And if you look at, uh, for example, Shakespeare's first print run versus his later print runs, there are many, many terms that have been expurgated. Uh, zooms, which was God's wounds, um, that, you know, to the point that nobody had heard it said for so long that when it finally made it back in, when the original print runs were discovered, people said zounds. Um, snails is the other one, God's nails. So for a long time, swear words dropped out of popular culture and they dropped out of, or seemed to have dropped out of female centered, centered speech. And so it was largely thought in research that women weren't swearers. So when, when psychologists started to study swearing in about the 1940s, 1950s, um, for various reasons, sometimes it was behavioral, sometimes it was Freudian. They would largely look at men. It was thought to be a phenomenon that didn't affect women. And then we get to about the 1950s, 1960s, and you have some female undergraduates that are starting to come on these behavioral psychology courses, and they are being involved in this research about swearing in the classroom. And most of these young female undergraduates were telling their male professors that, of course, no, they didn't swear. They didn't understand what any of these swear words meant. They were completely ignorant of any form of swearing whatsoever. As these female undergraduates went on to become graduate students, they were then replicating these sorts of studies. And lo and behold, when women asked women about swearing, they were far more honest about their use of swear words that actually women know plenty of swear words and use them in very much the same way as men. It's just that we still find now in behavioral studies that women tend to use fewer swear words around members of the opposite sex. Men also use fewer swear words around members of the opposite sex. But when women are alone with women, we swear just as much as men on average. The internet has changed things slightly because everybody is talking in a bit more of a public sphere at the moment. And I'd be very interested to see how this research has changed over the last sort of five, 10 years in particular. Um, but this idea that women are pure of language has managed to persist for about 400, 450 years with, with very little pushback. And it's only in the last sort of 40, 50 years that women's swearing has started to be recognized as something that exists. However, women run a far greater social risk than men when they swear. Uh, there are several studies that have essentially taken the same methodology. You write out a load of phrases with swearing in, you write these little snippets of fabricated dialogue, and you randomize whether or not each of these phrases is supposed to have come from a man or a woman. Um, and you send these out in their thousands to people and you say, you know, please fill in this questionnaire, send it back, let me know which of the most offensive swear words to you. And you don't draw the respondent's attention to the gender of the, of the purported speaker, you just send these out fairly blind and tally the results when they come back. And by randomising whether or not the speakers are male or female, so half of the um, half the group get one set, half the group get the other. You can see whether or not gender or perceived gender is having an impact on the strength of swear words. And it turns out that women, when they swear, are judged far more harshly than men when they swear. So for any given word, it is deemed more offensive by both men and women when it's said by a woman than when it's said by a man. We also find this in studies of people who have long term illnesses, whether that's uh, cancer, arthritis, um, that men who swear, particularly men who swear with their male friends, tend to report far greater feelings of support and of emotional release. Whereas women who swear am among their friends when they you know, are dealing with life altering illnesses are much more likely to lose friends and to feel less supported. And this to me is actually quite upsetting the fact that we still have this gendered double standard about swearing 
that is based on this very outdated idea that you know, women should maintain this air of innocence uh, and that this is somehow this would maintain their chastity, their purity, their obedience. Uh, by not knowing these words, they would be better people. When actually all it's doing is, is robbing us of a very important part of our emotional vocabulary. And we know it's a really important part of our emotional vocabulary because it exists in every language around the world. There is no language that doesn't have some form of words that is taboo, that is only used with great care, that is rarely used on new encounters, uh, that is used in such a way as to either provoke a positive or negative emotion, uh, and that causes a physiological response to all of those hallmarks of swearing. There is something like that in each and every language. The myth that some languages don't have swear words is because what constitutes a taboo is highly variable. So in Japan, for example, there isn't the excrement taboo to the same degree as we have in particularly in North America and to some extent the United Kingdom. Our words for excrement tend to be quite offensive, less so over time, but quite offensive. Whereas in Japan, it's just a sort of friendly thing you might say to a friend. There's this building in downtown Tokyo that is the Asahi Brewery Company's headquarters that has this golden sort of, it's supposed to be a wisp of uh, a foam coming off a beer, but it is known as the golden turd. Um, the reason we have a poop emoji is because emojis came out of Japan. So it quite often is the case that people would visit other countries and go, wow, they, they don't swear because they just talk about poo like it's nothing. But if you call someone stupid, that is painfully offensive. There are countries in the world where insulting somebody's moustache is essentially fighting talk. Um, there are countries in Northern Europe, particularly uh, Germany and the Netherlands, that use the names of illnesses as essentially curses. Uh, saying things like cancer and typhoid are swear words. Um, they are essentially telling that person that you wish that they become very, very sick. Whereas if I just suddenly yelled typhoid at someone in the middle of the street, I think the main reaction would be confusion. My favourite one, I have no idea if there are any Canadians or French Canadian, uh, sorry, Canadians or, or European French people on the call tonight, but um, my favourite example is the fact that European French tends to have fairly similar swearing vocabulary to, to us, they're, they're somewhat closest neighbours, um, tends to be bodily functions, the sexual continence of one's mother, uh, the sexual prowess of oneself, particularly if you're male, um, you know, body parts, body functions, all those sorts of things. Whereas in French Canadian, swear words tend to be far more religious. There is talk of tabernacles and the, the communion host, which if, again, if you were try to try to swear in this way in European French, in, in, in France, then, then this would provoke no emotional reaction except perhaps perplexity. There's been a divergent evolution that is entirely based on culture rather than on anything to do with the sounds in the language. So that's something that we do know from comparative linguistics is it puts the lie to the idea that swearing is satisfying because somehow there are sounds that feel particularly good to say. The reason we know that it's unlikely to be that is that the, the words that have, or the terms that have constituted swearing have varied so much both across time and between nations or between cultures within nations even. There isn't a common swearing vocabulary. And while we might enjoy saying certain swear words, it isn't because of their phonological properties, it's because of their emotional properties. Um, the other thing that this uh, universality of swearing, uh, certainly to me anyway, raised the question of is how far back does swearing go? Is it a recent invention? Is it an historic invention? There are various problems with trying to figure this out. The first is that quite often swearing is informal language. As I mentioned in the definition, it's the kind of language that you tend to be 
careful about using unless you're really certain of your audience. So most written historical documents did not collect swearing as it was used in a, a more sort of free and easy kind of way. We are very fortunate to have sites like Pompeii and Herculaneum where you can see uh, graffiti on the wall that is incredibly coarse and does have some things that we would still recognize as being quite offensive um, or at least you know obviously intended to be risible but there is something about the kind of language that tends to get written on toilet doors that seems to have lasted a long time in European culture um, particularly about um, again it, basically um, dissing somebody the male's sexual prowess or the sexual continence of his mother it's so hard to say without swearing um, but yes, yeah, saying saying that a, a man is not out there shagging enough women or a woman is out there shagging too many men, the sexual double standard, um, that stuff has been scrawled on latrine walls since the first latrine walls that we've been able to uncover in archaeology. Um, the other reason why it's, oh, sorry, the other reason why it's very difficult to determine where it started, though, is it is quite often a verbal phenomenon because it is so emotive. Swearing tends to come out of us in the heat of the moment. We're elated or excited or injured. Um, and this is a, another myth about swearing that I'd like to address, which is that swearing is consistently negative uh, in British English, at least. And I'll come on to some other nations in a minute, but in British English, at least, we know that, for example, football fans uh, who are a, a very easily studied group because they are very vocal about their support of their team on Twitter and they make it very clear who they are following. You can look at a soccer match and say, oh, you know, Liverpool, their fans are going to be really happy because they've just scored a goal, whereas Man United fans are very unhappy because they just conceded that goal. And I did some research in about 2008, which looked at when football fans swear. And it turns out, I, it, not an earth shaking finding, football fans swear all the time. Uh, but if you look at the ratio between the F word and the S word, the, uh, the, the uh, copulatory verb and the excremental noun, um, you find that there is actually this really telling ratio that the F word is used all the time for excitement, for joy, for elation, for surprise, for fury, whereas the excremental one is only ever used when things go badly wrong. So by looking at the, um, let's call it the phi sigma ratio and be very pretentious, but the relationship between the F word and the S word, you can see whether or not a football game is going really well. So we built this model and tested it with predictions of sort of saying, oh, we think that um, just from looking at the Twitter stream, we can tell which team is winning at any given time. And lo and behold, it has enormous predictive power. Um, so just, there was a serious point to that research, which was that at the time, companies like Facebook and Twitter were saying, we can make the internet far more civil just by banning swearing. Because whenever anyone's swearing, they're being abusive and offensive. And it turns out it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, so that was a fun bit of research, but it did show that swearing is both universal and not universally offensive, that it is used for lots of other fun reasons. The other reason we know that it's used for other fun reasons is because of studies from Australia and New Zealand. And I've yet to see if this has been replicated in the States. And I'm not sure if that's because it's a phenomenon that doesn't exist in the States. But there is a phenomenon called jocular abuse. And again, abuse is a bit of a misnomer here because people deliberately choose things that to an outsider might sound incredibly rude, but to their in-group are actually just really good in-jokes. And what we do when we make these sort of jocular abuses, when you call a friend of yours, you know, a, um, a fat person whose parents weren't married, um, if your mate is really self-conscious about their weight, that is not a joke you would make. You only make that joke with either someone who is skinny but happens to be eating a lot at lunchtime or someone who has no qualms about their weight. 
And the research around jocular, jocular abuse, whether it contains swearing or not, finds that the closest friendships in particularly very male dominated environments tend to be ones in which sharing and otherwise offensive terms, uh, sorry, swearing and otherwise offensive terms are shared back and forth all, all the time. Uh, and the reason for this seems to be that when we swear, we take a huge social risk. We're saying that there is a chance that we might offend someone. This terminology is so emotive that it could be misconstrued. So what we choose to do when we swear at or with a friend is we're saying, I trust that you trust that I'm not trying to be horrible to you here. I trust that you know that our relationship is close enough that I can't possibly be trying to really hurt you, which is an odd multi-layered theory of mind bit of stuff that we do. Uh, this idea of sort of jokey swearing at one another, uh, but it is something that is common in many countries, not just English speaking countries. Uh, and one of the few countries where I haven't seen that study replicated is the United States. And I, if anyone has any theories as to why that might be, please do bring them up in the chat. Um, I'm going to stop for questions in about five minutes, but there's just one more thing that I want to mention about swearing and its universality and the fact that it can be used in so many different ways. So I mentioned earlier that it's not possible to find the oldest use of human or proto-human swearing. We have no idea when humans or Neanderthals first swore. Although there was a very interesting study published the other day that looked at Neanderthal cochlea, the shape of Neanderthal cochlea, and it seems that um, our closest evolutionary cousins could hear the same ranges of sound as us sort of homo sapiens can hear uh, in terms of being able to process speech. So beyond simple calls or grunts, Neanderthals also seem to have a wide verbal range, but we have no idea what they were saying to one another. But in about 19, in the 1960s, there was a couple called Roger and Deborah Foots, um, and they adopted some chimpanzees, starting with a female chimpanzee whose name was Washo, but building up this essentially an extended family of chimpanzees that they they cross fostered they took into their home and they spoke only in sign language with these chimpanzees and the reason they did that was that people had tried to teach chimpanzees to talk before but they just don't have that vocal apparatus or the auditory apparatus that we have they don't use vocalizations either in the wild or in captivity but they are very gestural so Roger, Deborah and their research team just used sign language. They didn't even speak to one another around the chimpanzees. They only used sign language to one another. And these chimpanzees picked up these signs. They didn't do it like Project Nim with the, um, you know, we'll do a sign and if you can copy the sign, you get a treat. They did it the way that I taught my daughter language, which is just by chattering away all the time. And, repeating things back to her that sound a little bit like they might be words and you know just sort of whatever she says something that sounds like it might be a thing pointing at thing and you know cup oh cup you mean cup she might not mean cup I have no idea uh, but over time certain things are reinforced and they become the bedrock of language and now aged four and a bit uh, she is now verbal enough that she managed to get our housemate in trouble she went she saw her, um, so we live in an extended family with my husband, my daughter, my housemate, um, his house, his, my housemate's daughter, and they act very, pretty much like sisters. Uh, and our housemate had complained bitterly about the ex-wife not being uh, prepared for the return to school on Monday. And he said, oh, I knew I shouldn't have trusted Alex not to, you know, I knew she wouldn't get the, the school shirts ready on time. And then we did a Zoom call this evening with Alex. And uh, lo and behold, the little voice pops up. Alex, Mike knew he shouldn't have trusted you about the school shirts. <laughs> so she understands language, but she doesn't understand social niceties yet. But she didn't do that by me rewarding her for getting words right. She did that 
by us living together as a family and having to communicate certain things and we've yet to teach her the rules about what not to communicate when but we will be working on it um but the chimpanzees were taught in exactly the same way uh, chimpanzees in project washo and they started to invent their own parts of speech so for example they would refer to watermelons as these drink fruits um and thermos flasks they put together the signs for drink and hot but the other thing you need to do if you are going to foster chimpanzees in your home is you need to potty train them as chimpanzees in the wild uh, it's fair to say do not have an excremental taboo they will use that stuff to communicate they will fling it to mark their territory or to communicate their disapprobation of one another so the foots and their team installed this fecal taboo in the same way that we do with human children they potty trained them to the point that washo the first chimpanzee that they had would not even go to the toilet outside in the woods when they went for a walk in the woods she'd insist on you know them finding you know going back to a toilet and the sign that they had taught these chimpanzees that was everything to do with going to the toilet the sign is dirty which is a, a hitting under the jaw like this the chimpanzees then started to use that sign for everything that annoyed them for everything that they were frustrated with any time that they were angry so if roger was saying you know we can't go out to the play area we need to do you know we need to clean up your space first you know be like dirty rod dirty dirty and even among themselves when the chimps were arguing they would use the same sign and roger fruits writes very eloquently in his book next of kin about the fact that you could hear the clacking of these jaws of these chimpanzees when they were rowing um, which is not something you'd ever see in the wild but they're using the sign dirty they're calling each other a excrement but also they develop this scatological sense of humor as well um it's about the same level as you know when our kids are about three years old of you know just saying the word dirty to try to make the grown-ups go um or pretending that they needed to go to the toilet when they didn't so they had this scatological sense of humor and they would use again this taboo term knowing or apparently knowing that it's going to cause an emotional reaction in the humans that were running this study now, this doesn't tell us anything concrete about our earliest form of language. Of course it doesn't. Our developmental trajectories have been very different. Um, you know, chimpanzees being brought up among, up among humans are still chimpanzees. Um, our evolutionary histories have obviously been incredibly different. So we have no idea if this is a recapitulation of human experience. But quite often we talk about things being either necessary or sufficient. Uh, and we know that, at least in the case of chimpanzees, a taboo and the means to express it is sufficient to create a behaviour that looks very similar to those conditions that I mentioned at the beginning that we would define as swearing. And that to me was the most interesting finding in the book. Um, I had to go off base from neuroscience for a bit and it, it took the most digging, but for me that was the the thing that really made me respect swearing was the fact that its universality is so great that our closest cousins that are non-human when they learn to communicate and they learn to booze one of the first things they invent is the ability to have a really good swear so i'm going to hand back to matt matt are you going to read the questions or shall i just yeah sure yeah i can read them uh, so a couple have come in so far and feel free to uh, keep typing questions in everyone. Um, so the first one is, is the tone of voice during use of swear words shared between, shared between people almost as important as the words themselves? That's a really good question. That's from, yeah, from Mike. That's a great question. And it's not something that I've seen much research on. Um, the reason being that uh, a lot of this research has been done by making transcripts of what people are saying um, and there are different ways of doing these transcripts you can you can capture things like pauses and stress and what have you but 
I think you're right. There are ways in which through intonation, through stress, and also th through things like uh, posture and gesture, we show whether or not we are being, you know, funny or not. Um, there are, you know, there are certain sarcastic markers in the face and in the body that sort of, show, like my daughter, <laughs> my daughter, like I said, she's nearly five. She has inherited that this means sarcasm. I don't know where she's got it from, um, but she will say things like, I'm really happy I'm going to bed now. And say, you're being sarcastic, aren't you? But we managed to do this in a much more fluid way. So there's something that these things, these studies don't capture is how much is vocabulary how much is body language, gesture, posture, and how much is tone. And I, I suspect you're right that the, the tone, that shared tone is very important. I also suspect that that's why swearing, sarcasm, jocular abuse are so much harder on the internet, uh, on um, Twitter, on, you know, even on Zoom, you can't see my whole body here. And I know that the the resolution both in terms of time and space of my face is less on zoom you will be missing micro expressions that we we know we rely heavily upon uh, in face-to-face -face communication so i suspect that you are right that be even beyond tone of voice there is something about that shared in-person experience that we don't capture when we just look at the semantic content of swearing. I think you're right. Uh, and the next question is from Arnie. Uh, does the use of, for example, jeepers or egads and other substitutes by persons whose morality does not permit them to use the other words, have do they have the same function as the use of the standard swear words? That, again, that is a great question. And it's something that uh, researchers, including Rich Stevens, the guy who originally set me off down this path, uh, have been looking at. So they did an experiment that the tone, the term that we tend to use for those uh, forms of words is minced oaths. Uh, so the idea that somehow you've taken an oath and you've chopped it into a little bit so it's not offensive anymore and easier to swallow. Um, he has done the same experiment with the ice water uh, with minced oaths versus neutral words and minced oaths versus swear words. There's really no difference in terms of pain, uh, being able to withstand pain between a neutral word and a minced oath. If that word doesn't have an emotional impact on you, then it doesn't create that analgesic effect, that sort of stress-based or arousal-based analgesia that swearing seems to cause. We did a fun experiment between us. There were the two, Rich Stevens, myself, and a lexicographer called Jonathan Green. And we got people to submit ideas for new minced oaths, like maybe, it, again, we were pretty certain that this wouldn't work, but we, you know, we test it. Um, whether or not there's something in the sounds that are used or whether there's some, there are some new taboos that we could generate new swearing. Now, my feeling, my argument was that you learn by adolescence. We, in the book, there are just about 50 studies that show that we fixate on our swearing vocabulary by the time we've reached our mid-20s. And so suddenly putting a new socially sanctioned swear word into society wouldn't work for two reasons. First is, if it's socially sanctioned, it's not taboo, it's not gonna work. Second is, it's new. So anyone who hasn't learned it before adolescence is not gonna to respond to it, even if it were taboo. But we tried anyway. Uh, and the two words that the, um, the mass of suggestions got whittled down to were fouch, on the grounds that it tested like the fricative and the sense that swearing had to be quite explosive and twist pipe which is my favorite i voted for twist pipe a lot because i just thought it sounded very rude but also very silly and we wanted to know if there's something about it being sort of the, whether there was the humor in swearing or the distraction was doing something and so rich took those back to the lab and neither of them worked at all the only things that work to kill pain are the genuine swear words that have that emotional resonance for you. 
that said, there are ways in which we can, um, so I, I haven't tended to use the minced oaths tonight, but there are ways in which we can talk about swearing without swearing. So things like the copulatory verb, the excrement, the excremental noun, I think I ended up using. There are others that I really have to try to think of uh, examples for. But again, by the time you have cognitively unpacked what those words mean, they've lost a lot of the emotional impact. And then my final point on that actually would be there's some, again, some, ah, I don't have time to get in really deep into it tonight, but just to say that for most right-handed Westerners and for quite a few left-handed Westerners as well, the parts of the brain that tend to deal with language, either its understanding or its production, tend to be uh, on the left hemisphere of the brain, uh, two areas in particular identified by Broca and Wernicke uh, are really important for both understanding and producing language. That's spoken, uh, gestural, sign language, written, what have you. And so when people have strokes that affect the left side of the brain or have some sort of illness, you know, cancer or a lesion of some sort, or even in the case of incredibly radically an entire left hemispherectomy. So the entirety of this side of the brain is gone and the patient is left only with the right side of the brain. People can still function and they still live, but they tend to be aphasic, which strictly speaking means without language. But they're rarely without language. People can have the entire left hemisphere of their brain removed and they will in the majority of cases, still swear incredibly fluently whenever there is something that is emotionally resonant, resonant enough to provoke that swear word. And we've known this since Victorian times. This is the thing that really blows my mind. Um, there is particularly, so Broca was one of them, but John Hewlings Jackson, uh, he used to go to what were called asylums, but were you know hospitals for people who had a whole range of things from behavioural disorders, behavioural difficulties through to people who had had strokes. And he studied aphasics and the only way you could look at the structure of someone's brain in those days was post-mortem. So he would follow people up to and then just past their death. And he noticed that people who had difficulty with language tended to have damage on the left side of the brain. But he also noticed that they weren't aphasic, you know, that 150 years ago, we knew that aphasics were not without speech, that they would swear. And this is still rediscovered in, uh, in case studies about once every 20, 30 years. And there's some great case studies in the book, uh, including one person who had been without speech since his stroke. Uh, in fact, he may even have been an and hemispherectomy patient. And there's a standardized test for, you know, what parts of language people have lost. So sometimes it can do strange things, like it can, you can keep, uh, you know, almost everything apart from your nouns, which is astounding. So they would show these cards and it's sort of things like, you know, a picture of a watch or a clock or a chair or a picture of someone running or eating or dancing. And these researchers were noting down the responses of the person they were showing the cards to. And they would note things like, you know, he pauses for N milliseconds and then makes this particular sound and this is his facial expression. And then he gives up and gestures for the next card. They also had within this uh, various famous people, including Margaret Thatcher, I think Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. And they mentioned that when they showed the card of Ronald Reagan, that this person suddenly responded with a perfectly formed and fluent set of swear words, which seems to have been a genuine emotive reaction uh, provoked entirely by this person's political leanings, but that only something that emotional could cause speech to be produced. And that's because we now know that speech is what's called redundant in computer science. We, so that doesn't mean that we don't need it. That means that when you have redundancy, you have multiple ways of achieving the same ends. And we have redundancy for speech and particularly emotive speech because there are so many ways that we, um, or so many things that we need to coordinate in order to be able to create speech. If you think of the muscle movements involved in speaking, from the outside, ignoring my, my vast gestures, which I, you know, you would have, if you tied my thumbs together, I could not talk. Um, but your, 
your lips, your teeth, your jaw, your tongue, so maybe your lips, your jaw, your tongue, um, then moving further back, vocal cords, uh, moving further down, you know, the lungs, the diaphragm. There's so much we have to coordinate in order to be able to speak. And that those muscle movements are stored in multiple places. They can be driven from multiple places in the brain. So the, the motor cortex movements don't just have one fragile connection from brokers or from Fernicas saying, you know, now make the, the movements that make the word cat. There are multiple things in your brain, uh, a, a phenomenon that I studied for a while called cell assemblies. And if you're interested in that, there is a, a book by a, a very early neuroscientist called um, Donald Hebb uh, about the fact that we don't have single neurons or single connections that rem remember things. We have whole assemblies of cells. Language rests on these extremely broad cell assemblies. And some of those extend into other parts of the brain, particularly parts of the brain that are very emotional. So the reason why those min stoves don't work in the same way as swearing does is that those min stoves don't make it into that redundant set of terms because they don't have that emotional resonance. Um, let's have a look at some other questions. There's, um... There's one that came in um, privately that's, uh, does the use of, um, pardon me, but Jesus Christ or Jesus replicated, uh, does that replicate across other religions in swearing? Ah, um, that's a good question. I don't have a clear answer to it. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I know that there is some Oh, I did some research on it and it didn't quite fit into the book, but I think Melissa Moore, who's done the history of swearing, she, her book might talk about this. Um, the link between the degree of religiosity in a society and the more likely it is to be using um, the names of saints, uh, prophets, religious leaders, um, and also the use of curses of like literal, you know, word magic, like cancer and typhus. Um, but I, yeah, I know certainly in the UK, you can plot the decline in attendance at church and the decline in the offensiveness of the religious swear words. And they do, they correlate and it's likely that they're, they are, uh, sorry, they, they, yes, they, yeah, they're correlated and it's like there's a causal link through the effect of taboo. Uh, but I don't know for sure how that replicates well. Yeah. There's um, another, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, no, you pick the questions. <laughs> there's another one um, uh, related to job stress and maybe you had touched upon it, but uh, if swearing, the question is, if swearing relieves stress, is there data showing that people in stressful jobs swear more? My experience in healthcare shows ER workers are fabulous swearers. And the more stressful the shift, the more you hear swearing. And I can think of my own uh, experience working in a kitchen as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there is, there is, there are some wonderful studies, uh, particularly comparing different departments within the same hospital. So the same underlying sort of corporate culture, um, I know that demographically different specialties in, uh, in medicine tend to attract slightly different people. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the real big swearers were the, um, oh, oh my God, I can't remember the proper name for it. I can, sorry, my, my friend calls them carpenters and that isn't right at all. <laughs> the people who go, like osseo, no. Bone docks. What do you call the bone docks? The ones who basically go in and 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 pull chunks out of you and move chunks around. I have completely forgotten the name of that specialty. Um, whereas, I I, just, like, no, I my brain has gone dead for this bit of medicine. Someone put it in the chat, please. Um, <laughs> oh my god, bone dock, bone dock. To is orthopedic. Orthopedic orthopods. There we go. 
<laughs> yeah, my friend, called, sorry. Um, yeah, the friend who I got most of the, the links to the medical studies from, she, she calls them carpenters because um, she's a cardiac surgeon and she is disrespectful to orthopedic surgeons. So apologies to any orthopedic surgeons on the call. Um, but yeah, she, she anecdotally says the same thing, but there are, yeah, there are some really nice um, ethnographic studies that come out of uh, particularly medicine, but also flight decks uh, and black box recordings. Um, what was the other? Uh, specialism as well. Um, I don't think kitchens was one that came up, but definitely medicine, aviation, law enforcement as well. And that when you look at recordings where swearing is starting to go up, you tend to see that the situation is getting more stressful. But there's also a point of no return when even swearing fails and the person who is stressed is now beyond any form of language. I sometimes refer to swearing as the language that is left when all other language fails us. And that is usually a sign to relieve somebody of their position on a, you know, it's when the first officer should intervene if the captain is has gone through swearing and is now out the other side. Um, you know, someone should tap out a surgeon who, because once people stop swearing, there is a sign that is a sign that they are so overloaded that all of these redundant ways of communicating are overwhelmed and therefore that person is overwhelmed um so yeah it's a really interesting uh observation i mean obviously we can't make well i don't know maybe with some some of the virtual surgery simulators they're using training but there are no sort of fmri or even eeg studies of people in the stressful situations because ethically adding to the stress of what is already a sort of very risky job where other people's lives are at risk is, is very unethical um but i am very very interested to to see any of those sort of ethnographic research any behavioral research um, I think we might have time for one more question. Okay. That's all right. Would um, would you be able to talk about oh, the connection so swearing and Tourette syndrome? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the the chapter in the book on Tourette's is called "Why This Chapter Should Not Be in This Book," um, and that's because tw only twenty five percent of people with Tourette syndrome actually have either coprolalia copographia or copropraxis so that is the saying of swear words the writing of swear words or the signing of swear words either in sign language or in commonly recognized gesture um so in the uk I do, is this really offensive if i do this in the states i have no idea yes yeah. oh, right 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 because i was now yeah, i was told that you guys didn't do yeah all right because I was told that there were there's one that's an Italian one which is more offensive, but but you know the the New York driver's hand signal. Um, the only twenty five percent of people, depending on how the studies run, but it is sort of between about five percent and thirty percent suffer at all with any of those forms of spontaneous swearing, and that there are far more other ticks that tend to be either motor ticks. Um, including things like I think they call torsades but a sort of moving of the head um things that involve sort of hair pulling or uh, scratching or other forms of movement just shouting in general uh one of my favorite case studies that's in the book uh was a chap who was in his probably early 20s and his symptoms are starting to lessen as quite often happens so Tourette tends to first onset during early adolescence and for many people with Tourette syndrome it drops off uh, as they get through adolescence and into adulthood um, but instead of swearing he had the uncontrollable desire to yell his ex-girlfriend's name during sex with his new girlfriend and thankfully she was pretty chill about it but again it's that idea of it's not strictly speaking a swear you know how where does he fall in? It, it, it's obviously taboo. It's quite offensive to his current girlfriend, but it's not strictly speaking a swear word. So there is this question of whether or not in Tourette syndrome, it is the idea of risky language uh, and, and risky taboo things or situations. But 
some of the stuff we know from studies of people with Tourette syndrome is that people with Tourette syndrome have incredibly highly tuned dopamine uh, receptors. So let me give you an example of one of the studies that I came across, which again, I just I had to include it, even though it is nothing to do with swearing, I, I could include it because people always ask about Tourette's, rightly so, it's, it's one of the first things people think about. Um, if you set people a task where you say there are, you know, the, 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 the characters on the top line of your keyboard, um, you have to type in these random five letter strings from the top line of the keyboard, and we're going to give you 20 to memorize. 10 of these will pay you a dollar every time you get it right. 10 of these only pay you a single cent. Neurotypical people do equally terribly on all of them, to be honest. It's sort of, you know, they, they can usually remember about half of them and they, they, they get them right most of the time and it takes them a few seconds. But, you know, after several repetitions, neurotypical people are capable of remembering random five letter strings. People with Tourette who are not medicated uh, with uh, the kinds of medication that interfere with the dopamine pathways, not only learn how to do these and phenomenally fast, they preferentially learn the ones that have a dollar reward rather than a cent reward to the point where their performance on the ones that have the higher reward just goes through the roof, like just superhumanly good. Uh, and the scent ones about the same as neurotypicals, maybe slightly worse because they seem to be able to shift their effort to things that have a higher reward. Whereas if you take people with Tourette syndrome, and again, usually quite young people with Tourette syndrome that are on medication, uh, and the kind of medication that they use is quite often also used in Parkinson's disease because again it acts on these dopamine pathways. They can't lose, they can't learn any of these uh, five letter random strings. And so one of the things that I conclude in the book, drawing together these various studies and talking to various research groups, is that we tend to offer, suggest, medication to young people with Tourette syndrome because of our discomfort with their symptoms. Whether that is swearing or whether that is a motor tick or whether that is calling out your ex's name, it tends to be that adolescents, children with Tourette, are certainly in the UK anyway, likely to be medicated for the comfort of the people around them. And if they are unmedicated, they are much more likely to be excluded from school. They're much more likely to be on the receiving end of bullying and just horrible forms of discrimination. So you have these kids who are sort of 14, 15, 16 at this time when they should be learning so much and experimenting so much and figuring out who they are. The time at which that plasticity about you know, the kinds of things that we believe in, what our values are as people, even what swear words we like and dislike, these are all being shaped by a really high functioning dopamine receptor system, which is why you, the Tourette syndrome often comes on in adolescence. And we are taking kids and switching that off. And so kids with Tourette syndrome are caught in this horrible catch-22 of be medicated and have normal adolescent experiences but not really be able to learn from them or not be medicated but be excluded from all of those experiences. There is another way of addressing Tourette syndrome and it comes from the states and so you know you, you guys may be horrified to hear that we're still essentially giving drugs for Parkinson's disease to 15 year olds in the UK but we are. But one of the best things that you can do in a family with a, an adolescent with Tourette syndrome is to take the stress out of the situation. Some of the studies that I talk about in the book, they look at the effect of stress, like by basically giving kids with Tourette syndrome, um, you know, sort of maths exams and things like that. And either say you can swear or you can't swear. 
or sorry, you can tick or you can't tick. Sorry, my apologies, important distinction. The children who were forbidden from ticking did worse on the tests and felt more compulsion to tick. The ones who were given no such injunction did better on the test and also their ticks were somewhat manageable. So the first thing is to do something behavioral for the rest of us, which is to be accepting of the fact that Tourette's syndrome is a neurological condition and that their tics are no more controllable than my need to wear glasses to read. That's item number one. And the other thing is a behavioral approach that centers the child and their family, which is to try to not stop the tics, but if the tic is causing pain or discomfort for the child, which again, a lot of the muscle tics and movement disorder tics can lead to lifelong chronic pain, is to try to get the child to think of something else that is um, uh, behaviorally inconsistent with that tick. So if, for example, it's a, it's a hitting tick, say, you know, when you find yourself wanting to do that, clap instead. And every time the child manages to divert the tick to a non-harmful behavior, reward them, congratulate them, say, well done. Tourette syndrome is not a behavioral disorder. It is a neurological disorder. That said, there are ways of diverting that neurological pathway into less harmful behaviors for the child. But we need to change our view completely of Tourette syndrome from, oh my God, that person's doing a, a thing that is embarrassing or emotive or stressful for me to, they have Tourette syndrome. It's moderately disruptive, but we need to move past that because the more we make that person feel stressed about the disruption, the harder it's going to be for them to divert the urge to tick or to to calm, you know, to recenter themselves and, and, and not tick. I mean, people are resistant to this uh, behavioral approach because of the fact that Tourette syndrome, when it was first um codified was was thought to be a sort of freudian disturbance um it is not it is a neurological disorder um and that it, it, some of the therapies that were originally suggested seem very odd these days um you know getting young boys to write about their sexual fantasies about their mothers whether they had them or not um so I can see why for it's take a long time for behavioral psychology to become involved in the management of Tourette syndrome. Uh, but yeah, the best thing we can do for kids, and it is predominantly kids who first experience Tourette syndrome, is to accept that that is what their brain is doing. Their dopamine system found some behavior incredibly rewarding for whatever reason and has now wired a very strong connection between that behavior which may seem completely unrewarding and their reward circuits of the brain and until that connection extinguishes usually in later life usually by itself sometimes with some behavioral support the best thing you can do is just not shame them for it. So yeah, that, that was my conclusion from the Tourette's chapter is that, yeah, we, we get, we the hearers get upset about swearing, but also about seeing people do things that look injurious to themselves or seem otherwise disruptive. The more upset we get, the worse it is for the person who is experiencing these ticks. So yeah, uh, someone else has mentioned as well, for persons with developmental disabilities, straight accidents, supports and accommodations, school, government and society. Excellent question. My, uh, and someone had mentioned about the stroke and everything being the F word. Yeah, we're never going to be able to make swearing untaboo. We're never gonna be able to make swearing unemotive. It's in its very nature that you know people with stroke who have had left side strokes people who have dementia and other forms of cognitive decline uh, particularly things that uh, lower your ability to control your impulses tend to swear more but being aware of and 
I sort of hate this word because it sounds so wishy-washy, but owning, realizing that we might feel awkward, offended, shocked, surprised, but going, have I been hurt by this? Am I in danger? Is anything that this person is saying going to cause me any sort of problem? Or can I look past that outburst or that reflex and truly listen to what this person is trying to communicate to me? Then that is by far the best way we can deal with those, those uses of swearing, whether they are deliberate by someone who is in emotional distress, whether they are um, sort of reflex by someone who has Tourette's, or whether they are simply the last remaining form of language for someone with a stroke or cognitive decline, treating their swearing as if it is something that has meaning and is not just something to be repelled by, I think it's the best accommodation we could make. Well, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, actually, someone just wrote in the comments the comments. Uh, thank you for your comments and insights. We have a lot of work to do here in Lexington to work towards acceptance and inclusion and hashtag neurodiversity and DEI. Um, but thank you uh, very much for taking time out of well, what's your night and our afternoon to talk with us today. Um, this program. Thank you, yeah. for, thank you for bringing up the Tourette's discussion because, yeah, it is actually something that, you know, the swearing is a bit fun and a bit silly, but actually, yeah, in writing that chapter changed my understanding completely. So I'm glad that you mentioned it and brought it up. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this program was recorded, so uh, you can visit our YouTube channel and uh, watch the video there. Uh, but thank you again, everyone, for coming. And thank you again, Emma. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, did you want? Oh, yeah. Cool. I didn't know if you wanted to stay for a minute after or we could just block. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I can, either that or I can catch up with you by Yeah, email. over email. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thank you again so much for, for having me over. And um, yeah, that's one good thing about the pandemic. It's the ability to, to actually take part in programs like this. So thank you. Yeah, and it's been great because we've there's been a couple of speakers from, from England so that we would have probably never been able to have. Yeah, so yeah. But thank you again. We can catch up over email. Cool. All right, you take care. Yeah, okay. Have a good night. Thank you.